I want to read verses 1 through 8, Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 8, and then we'll pray. Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be honored by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving will be in secret, and your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. When you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners, so that they may be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, Close your door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask your mercy upon the time of preaching. We ask that you would use the preacher for your glory and that the hearers, the hearers, Lord, would be focused in mind by the power of your spirit to hear the truth of your word. Lord, apart from your, the work of your spirit, most of this would be meaningless. There would be some decent things said, but Lord, we're in need of your spirit to deal with our souls. We need conviction of our sin. We need strengthening of our daily lives. We need understanding of your word. And only your spirit will illumine the truth of your word, whether read or preached, rightly to our souls. And we ask that be so at this time, according to your will. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Last week, we surveyed really an overarching theme of verses 1 through 18 or 19. Um, there's some things said last week that I won't repeat this week, and so if you weren't able to hear some of that, I encourage you to go back because I've exposited some portions of these passages uh, in that message last week. I have some other focuses in verses 1 through 8 that I want to give this morning, and I want us to notice some of that as we observe some of the context of what the Lord is doing in these passages. Last week, we dealt with an overarching theme of motive. Why do you give? Why do you pray? And we even included the idea of fasting. Now this morning, I'm going to focus more on the section about giving and praying. And we're going to look at some of the context of giving and praying. But remember... The first and utmost of important ideas that the Lord Jesus gives here is us asking a question to ourselves. Why are you doing what you're doing? If you're doing it to make yourself look good, if you're doing it to make yourself feel good, if you're doing it for men to look at you, then your reward will be on this earth. We have to think of this in proper context. Why are you doing what you're doing? Giving, praying, fasting, and that goes for the whole of the Christian life. But even as we look at that, we consider some of the context of giving and praying. And first and foremost this morning, number one, recognize the assumed necessity 
regarding giving and praying. Recognize the assumed necessity regarding giving and praying. There's an important phrase that you will see in these verses. Verse 2, so when you give. Verse 3, but when you give. Verse 5, when you pray. Verse 6, but when you pray. Verse 7, when you are praying. This idea is not just a suggestion. There's an assumed necessity in the language of the Lord Jesus regarding giving and praying. One writer says, let us observe that our Lord takes it for granted that all who call themselves his disciples will think it a solemn duty to give according to their means to relieve the wants of others. The only point he handles is the manner in which the duty should be done. This same writer states the exact same thought regarding prayer. Another writer says, Jesus takes our necessity of prayer for granted. This means there is a necessary and appropriate time for both of these practices. And it's implicitly commanded here. The idea of the phrase, when you do it, Jesus is assuming his disciples will do this and they will understand it's by command. Giving even to the needy. That's what they're talking about specifically here in the passage is giving to those in need. According to their, your own means. The, the thoughtfulness of it. That's something the disciples of Christ will do. They will have a desire for that. It's, it's assumed. It's implicit command. It's assumed... You're going to do that. Praying is the same way. It's not up for debate whether we should pray. The Lord Jesus is saying, when you do it, as if we already know it's a command. So when you do it, do it this way. Do it from this background, from this purpose. Setting up that background, of course, once again, is based on the motive. Why are we doing it? But the context is in an implicit idea of command. When you pray, that means Christ people ought to be people who pray. Secondly, recognize the direct denial of mindless prayer. The direct denial of mindless prayer. Recognize the direct denial of mindless prayer. We already noted last week in verse 5 that he said, when you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites. We explained that phrase because it's used several times in this section of Scripture. But he goes on when he speaks of that prayer to say in verse 7 and when you are praying do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words the idea of the phrase here is not to stammer along in repetitive prayer historically the phrase Uh, comes from a background of of individuals maybe, maybe even a king who was known to to have a stutter or a babble. And so you will see in some versions of Scripture the actual word babble used. Do not babble. But the idea is that one would stammer along in a repetitive nature. It's not that all repetition is prohibited. That's not true. One writer says, Jesus cannot be prohibiting all repetition, for he repeated himself in prayer, notably in Gethsemane, when he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words. Perseverance and importunity in prayer are commended by him. If we think about that in Matthew 26, 39 through 34, the Lord Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, he comes back and forth to the disciples. And the indication in the text is, is that when the Lord Jesus goes back back to pray, he's praying something very similar that he was praying before about taking the cup. 
the idea of what the Lord would have done. Your will be done. He's praying that. So there is repetition, but the idea here that the Lord Jesus is going against is meaningless repetition or mindless repetition. So it is mindless repetition that is prohibited in prayer. Some Muslim prayers are mindless in repetition. One writer notes that at some Mohammedan funerals in some countries, devout men assemble and repeat, Allah el Allah, or God is God. And they do this some 3,000 times over and over and over again. To this very day, the Roman Catholic rosary prayer is mindless repetition. Each time the rosary prayer is prayed, the person repeats similar words and then moves beads on a strand in numerical order by specified number. They'll say these certain words and move a certain number of beads over on the rosary. And they do it over and over, time and time again. It's mindless repetition. The Lord Jesus is warning us, do not stammer along in thoughtless prayer. As one writer says, Jesus is condemning verbosity, especially in those who speak without thinking. The word describes any and every prayer which is all words and no meaning, all lips and no mind or heart. gets to the very crux of the Lord Jesus dealing with our motive. Even if you're going to stop for a moment and pray for a friend who might be ill or not feeling well, when you stop, stop and think about what you're doing. It's well and good just to say, Lord, help so-and-so. They're in the hospital. Thankful you stopped and thought about it for a moment. But think about who you're praying to. Think about what you're praying for. Don't let it be just mindless repetition. When you pray in confession of sin, don't let it be mindless repetition. Think about who you're praying to and what you are confessing your sin against the one true living holy God. The Lord Jesus is saying this was recognizable to his disciples in the Gentile culture. It's recognizable in the Jewish culture because there were a lot of times that the Pharisees would repeat uh, prayers and things publicly. And they would do so over and over again. Thinking little of what they were saying. The Gentile culture was known for repeating things over and over again. When Paul is confronted with uh, the worshipers of Diana at Ephesus. And they keep repeating over and over again uh, uh, words to Diana. The same three or four words over and over. And they yell it for uh, minutes and, and, and hours on end. Over and over and over again. It's meaningless chant. Maybe in our modern day culture we can... Uh, liken it in going to a sports event and just chanting the same two or three words over and over for our team. It becomes mindless at some point. You're not even really thinking about it. You're just yelling with the crowd. Some people go to a concert that way. It, you're not really thinking about the words of the song. You just hear the song and you're singing along because you know it. And maybe it's a song you like. Maybe it's a good song. I don't know. But whatever it may be, it becomes mindless at some point. The, the very music and emotion has carried us away to a mindless state to where we're just singing and saying whatever. And the Lord Jesus warns us that our prayer to the one true living God is not to be that way. It's not to be mindless. It's one thing to drive down the road and hear a song on uh, the radio or uh, your iPhone or whatever it is that you, however you listen to it now. Uh, 
Um, it's one thing to do that and to repeat those words mindlessly of that song. But when you go and you pray, even if you stop and pray for 30 seconds or a minute, don't be mindless about it. And the Lord Jesus tells us why in verse 8. He says, so do not be like them, those Pharisees, those Gentiles. For they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. If we keep repeating it over and over and over again, finally we'll be heard. Like a child trying to get the attention of a parent. They're just going to keep saying, Daddy, 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 Mommy, Mommy, Mommy. It happens. You've seen children do it. This is what the Gentiles are doing before their gods. It's just mindless repetition. He says, do not be like them. Why? For your father knows what you need before you ask him. Brings us to our third point. Recognize the immensity of the being of God in prayer. Recognize the immensity of the being of God in prayer. We need to note, long-winded appeals are not necessary for the eternal God. Long-winded appeals are not necessary for the eternal God. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute. The Gentiles kept just repeating over and over to their gods, crying out like a little child, saying the same thing over and over again. Hear me, hear me, hear me, hear me, hear me. Yes, me, 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 me. Now, 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 now. That's what they do. But you're approaching in prayer the eternal God, the one true living God. Are you just going to sound like that for eternity? He's eternal. Remember who you're addressing. The God who is. There is none other. He is eternal in his very being. Go before him and address him as that one true living eternal God. And trust me, if he's eternal, he doesn't need our mindless repetition. Why does he not need our mindless repetition? Secondly, under this third heading, long-winded, repetitive appeals are not necessary for the omniscient God. Long-winded, repetitive appeals are not necessary for the omniscient God. Recognize who you're speaking to. Jesus says, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. He's speaking of the very knowledge of God, that God knows all things, including our needs. There's not one thing that God does not know. He knows all things, about everything, at all times, throughout all of time, and he knows things that are eternal. That were before time and that will be after time. He created time. You are bowing before Him. Recognize who He is. Even if it's a, a 30 second prayer. Immediately. It takes just a few seconds to remember. You know what? I'm bowing before a holy God. Sometimes, you know, we say the blessing at our tables. Many of you probably do that most of your meals. And when you do that, sometimes it can become mindless. Let's just admit it. I can admit it. I've said the blessing thousands of times. And even sometimes because I'm a pastor, you go somewhere and they think, well, we got a pastor here. He needs to bless the food. He's the only one in the whole group that can actually pray over the food. How many blessings have I said? 
Sometimes they can become mindless. But remember, when you're asking or when you're praying, you're praying before this one living holy God. And if you're giving thanks for that meal, you are calling upon him and giving thanks that he is the one true living and only provider of all things. And what you're saying is, is he alone can do it. So when we go to the Lord in prayer, that prayer needs recognition of the very being of God. Secondly, remember the importance of submission to God in prayer. Remember the importance of submission to God in prayer. Several writers note something very important, and we've heard this for years. We hear people talk about, you know, well, if God already knows, why pray? And people will say, well, because prayer changes us. And there is truth to that. The Lord uses prayer in our lives to change our perspective, to change our outlook sometimes. But there's something even greater than that at hand. We need to remember when we go to the Lord in prayer, we are submitting to the very commands of the one living holy God. You know what prayer is? Prayer is submission. Now, why is that important? Because from our very core, we are conceived in sin in our mother's wombs. And we come out as little rebels. And we rebel against God. From the very day we come out of our mother's womb. Now, I want you to think for a moment. We're not just talking about, you know... We look at it from a human perspective. Oh, they're so cute. Oh, it's so precious. Look, it's so pretty. Look at that little baby. And they are. Well, some of them. <laughs> Let's be honest. Some of them aren't. I mean, I had one. And when it was born, I just looked at it and that. That's not a cute kid. He's cute now, but. Hey, it's, it's the honest truth, right? But we get this perspective in our mind. We look at these little babies and these little children and we like to think of them somehow as though they're different. They're not. They're born sinners. Rebels against God. You and I were born that way. When God changes the soul of a person, He changes them in such a way that they would submit to Him. And one of the ways that we submit to Him is in prayer. We go before him saying, I can't do it on my own. We go before him saying, there's no other way for these things to happen but by your will. We're submitting to your very throne. Human nature doesn't like to submit to something or someone else, does it? But prayer is a recognition of the necessity of submitting to the one true living holy God. That you would bow before him and him alone. Give him praise and adoration. You would petition him. You would confess unto him. You would give thanks. Saying from you and you alone. I'm submitting. That's what the heart of a believer will do. They'll submit to the one living true holy God. And they do it in prayer. If you're a person who is not willing to pray, then you're not being willing to submit to the God who saved you. Now let me ask you, is prayer important then? Is that what God's people are supposed to do, is to walk around in, in total defiance and to say to God, you know what, God, I, I'm relying on you, but I'll just do it my way. No. Prayer is a way we submit to Him. Even if it's for 30 seconds or a minute, we're submitting to Him, recognizing who He is. He knows all things. He is eternal. He knows all things. He has purposed all things. He has decreed all things. He alone is sovereign over all things, even the souls of men and women of children throughout all of history. God is sovereign. And we're submitting to you even by uttering these words in our mind or outwardly. We're saying, God, you alone 
can do this. You alone can bring me to this place. You alone can get me through this. Get them through this. You alone. Doesn't mean it has to be long winded and repetitive in a mindless nature. But remember about what we said about our motive. If we understand who God is and our motive in prayer will be different. We'll recognize we are submitting and bowing to the one living, true, holy God who has created all things in all time and space and history. And we are saying unto him, you are our king. And that's been shown to us, revealed to us in the person and work of your son, Jesus Christ, who now reigns and sits at the right hand of you, the father. And the work of your spirit has gone through all time and space and continues to this very day. And we're submitting to you. Because we're bowing before you. We're, we're speaking before you in such a way that we recognize who you are. If we recognize that God is omniscient, that means he knows all things. We can be sure that that which is supposed to happen will happen. That is why when we get into the Lord's Prayer, the phrase, your will be done, is so important. It's not that we can't ask for certain things. We will ask for those things in the context of what is biblical. Sometimes we ask, Lord, please save this person's soul. There's nothing unbiblical about that. But we're doing that in recognition that God alone knows the soul of that person, knows his purpose for the soul of that person, and therefore we're giving it unto him. So we have recognition, submission, and petition. Remember the importance of your petition to God in prayer. Remember the importance of petition to God in prayer. When you recognize who he is, then it puts your petition not in the I want of the mindless Gentile who just keeps acting like a child, ranting and chanting the same thing over and over again. It changes that to someone who is kneeling before the one true living holy God and petitioning saying, Lord, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We can petition a sovereign God, but we petition him according to his sovereignty, saying ultimately, no matter what our prayer may be, no matter what our petition may be, saying ultimately, your will be done. It's really a hard thing for us to say. The words come out of our mouths, but it's a hard thing for our hearts to say, isn't it? Because we have a will of our own. That's a problem with rebels, right? Rebels have a will of their own. I have a will of my own. I know what I want to happen. I, I would have very little problem articulating to you exactly what I want to happen in my life and in this world and the things around me. There might be a few things that might stump me, but for the most part, I could tell you what I want. And most of us are that way if we're honest. But when you petition God Almighty, the sovereign God of all things, the eternal God, the omniscient God, the omnipresent God, the one who is everywhere at once, He has no body or parts or passions like men. He just is. You're petitioning Him. He's not the, the God of the Greeks or the Romans or the God of our modern culture where we're trying to appeal to some manly idea or some womanly idea or some human construct to where we can appeal on a, a, a human behalf. No, we're appealing to the, the God who is. And we're petitioning Him saying, Lord, please do this according to your will. 
It's hard for us to get there in our hearts, though, isn't it? Because we know there are times we want it our way. According to your will, but just listen to me. According to your will, but just do what I want you to do. But the person that sees God the Father as the Lord Jesus understands and knows God the Father, they will see God as the one who knows all things and they will say, He is good and right, so therefore I will trust that He knows what is good and right. That can be hard. Because there are things that happen that sometimes we don't understand. They don't fit with our construct. Sometimes they don't even make sense. Do you recognize though, in every piece of mystery on this earth that you and I don't understand, the Lord God Almighty has a purpose for every single iota of it. Anything you can come up with, the Lord God has a purpose in it. Even sin. So why would we not bow before Him? Petition Him as who He is. And not do like the Gentiles do. Just keep chanting and ranting over and over. Hoping our Daddy will give us what we want. If we just say it long enough and loud enough. The Lord Jesus says, realize who he is. Go before him as who he is. Lift your petition up to him. And trust me, when you lift it, he hears you. And as you lift it. Recognize ultimately. He knows more than all of us. And because he is good, right, and holy, we will want his will to be done. Even if we don't always understand it. I'm going to leave you with two thoughts this morning. Number one. Biblical prayer is not irrational. I don't know how many times I've heard somebody say in some context that oh, prayer is irrational. It makes no sense. You're just uttering into the air. Well, hopefully, as we go through the Lord's Prayer, we'll get a context of biblical prayer. Now, not everything in the Lord's Prayer uh, is something we're just going to have every single time. But the, the context and the ideas will be right there. Biblical prayer concerns praying the doctrines and thoughts of the scripture. And the scripture is not irrational. If the scripture is not irrational, then if you're praying biblically, then prayer is not irrational. Not in itself, not what you pray. And if you're praying how the Lord has commanded you to pray, that prayer is not irrational because the very being of God is not irrational. There would be no rationality if it weren't for the very being of God. So if He's commanded us to pray, prayer must be rational. And if He's commanded us to pray according to His Word, He's doing so because His Word is rational. This is not a study to prove the rationality of God's Word. We can do that another time, but you have to recognize as believers the Word of God is not babble and gibberish. It is the explanation of what we need to know and understand the world around us, ourselves, to know who God is, and to know of the one true salvation in His Son by the power of His Spirit. And that's not irrational. 
The world is proving out every day sinners need to be saved. The world's proving every day that there are sinners. I mean, if there's one thing when you watch the news you ought to gain from it is depravity. If everybody's so basically good, then why does the news look like, look like it does? That's what captures our attention. Prayer is not irrational. Because biblical prayer is based on the scripture. The scripture is not irrational. The scripture is from God. Therefore, the scripture is not irrational because God is not irrational. Secondly and lastly, we need to know that biblical prayer is not transcendental meditation. Some people think you need to get into a prayer, a, a trance of some kind to, to be the most prayerful. And that's not what biblical prayer is. It's not transcendental meditation. Um, you know, if you, if you need to do stretches for your body, do them. Amen. Nothing wrong with that. Stretch your body out. It helps things, uh, you know, loosen up and you move around. Um, but sitting on a mat and, uh, you know, with mindless repetition going on in your head of, you know, uh, some sound, you know, that's not biblical prayer. One writer says, true meditation involves the conscious use of the mind. You can meditate on the scripture. But if you're going to meditate on the scripture and even do it in a prayerful way, it, it, it involves the conscious use of the mind. The scripture is never divorced, divorced from the mind. He goes on and says, but transcendental meditation is a simple and essentially mechanical technique for relaxing of both body and mind. Instead of stimulating thought, it is designed to bring a person to a complete state of stillness and inactivity. Now, you might need a, a moment of uh, inactivity. Maybe you need to relax your brain or something. Okay, fair enough. But don't get that confused with God in prayer. Those who are going to take seriously meditating on the scriptures and praying... It involves your mind and the conscious use of, use of your mind. And we've noted that by what the Lord Jesus has told us. If you're in some out-of-body experience, you're not thinking about who you're praying to. You're not recognizing whose throne you are approaching. You're not recognizing who you are calling out to. Because your mind is off in some la-la land. Do -do 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 -do. I mean, it's just out there. Well, okay. But that's not biblical prayer. Biblical prayer engages the mind, and it engages the mind according to the truth of the Scripture. And the Scripture, first and foremost, tells us who God is. And so when we pray to Him, we need to be reminded of who we're praying to. Meditate on the truth of the Word in a way that involves the conscious mind that leads you to prayerful thought, engaging the mind to pray before the one true living God. Think about what you're doing in prayer. That's what the Lord Jesus is saying. Why are you praying? If you can deal with your motive, then think about who you're praying to and what you're going to pray about and how you're going to pray. And all of that is in accordance with the scripture. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we have no hope in ourselves. We confess that our minds are wayward. They go in many different directions. And at times we just say words to you with our mouths or we think words to you just to work through the motion. 
Lord, will you give us ears to hear and minds to understand the truth of your word today by the power of your spirit? That mindlessness in prayer, meaningless repetition are null and void. By the power of your spirit, will you deal with our minds, our wills, and affections that even if we stop to pray for just a moment, that we would give recognition and submission to you in all of our petitions. We are a weak people. And in and of ourselves, we have nothing to offer you. So we come before you asking for you to work in us according to your word by the power of your spirit that the truth of your word would be illumined to us not just at this time right now but in such a way that we would seek to live it out in our daily lives we ask these things in the name of your son the lord jesus amen